Between 8th of August 1918 through to the 5th of October 1918, the Australians are fighting a series of engagements that are ever pushing the Germans eastwards towards the Hindenburg Line. The thing is, they're very costly in casualties. Between July and October 1918, the Australia Corps suffers 35,000 casualties. Battalions, which are usually at a thousand men strong, are being whittled down to 150. But there's very few reinforcements who are coming to, to build these units back up. The two conscription plebiscites have failed. The Australian forces are feeding upon itself. Back home, Australians knew how costly these battles really were because in those days, the casualty lists were printed in the newspaper. Australia's grief during this time was, was very public. For the average soldier in the trenches, the armistice comes on the 11th of November 1918 like a like a, like a bolt from the blue. The delegations from Germany and France and Britain had gathered in secrecy at Compiègne in a rail carriage. Uh, it ultimately ended with Germany formally accepting the armistice terms and a message was then communicated to all units on both sides of no man's land saying that an armistice would come into effect at 11 a.m. In the trenches, I mean, when the armistice is, is announced, there is almost this stunned sense of disbelief that the war was finally over. I think there was uh, a great uh, difficulty for Australian troops to comprehend that perhaps that the war had finally come to an end. The further you move away from the trenches, of course, there is a sense of jubilation where troops in rear bases uh, erupt in celebration and certainly there are major celebrations in London and in Paris and in Australia as well. We know this because uh, we have scenes of celebration in the streets of Sydney and in Melbourne. The First World War is fought in an era before the internet, before the widespread use of telephones. But in terms of the broader reporting of the war, actually the news was, was quite readily available because it was all sent via undersea cable which connected Australia to the rest of the world. And so when an armistice was announced, Australians know within 24 hours that the war had come to an end. So there is a sense that uh, Australians are immediately plugged into the, the broader, broader picture of what's happening in the, the world in Europe. But of course, uh, it's a bittersweet moment, you know, throughout 1919 and 1920 when the troops finally arrive home. I mean, it takes a very long time for the troops to come home. There is celebration the fact that you know, a son, a brother, a husband who had returned from the war physically unscathed, but it may have been a completely different individual to the individual who went to, went to war. And I think that's one of the, the great legacies of the First World War is the war just doesn't end in November 1918. It's a, it becomes this long shadow that casts over Australian history for decades to come. 330,000 Australians had served overseas 156,000 had become casualties, 62,000 had died overseas. Um, that's not something that the nation could readily sort of get over. There was the very real presence of wounded and maimed veterans uh, in Australian society for decades afterwards. I think the First World War created a precedence in the way in which we remember conflict. Australians had died serving overseas in conflicts before, but the global scale and intensity of the First World War created new forms of a commemoration. Certainly, Remembrance Day on the 11th of November was created specifically for the war dead of the First World War. And what's interesting is that that then become the day, the formal day of remembrance for not just the First World War, but for, for all wars. Uh, an opportunity for we as Australians to commemorate the war dead from the Second World War, from Vietnam, from Korea, and of course uh, up to and including Iraq and Afghanistan.